Yeah, welcome to session four of the uh, Simulation Summer School from uh, 2021. Um, uh, I'm joined here by Scott Chadwick, who's a PhD candidate at Lancaster University studying metacomprehension and is also uh, a bit of a uh, simulation in as well. Um, we are looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at logistic regression, um, logistic multi-level models and mm -hmm. response type stuff, so we're looking forward to that. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat, and so if you've got any questions, Sam's going to be checking uh, as we go along as well, so do feel free to, uh, to chime in whenever you like. Um, there's going to be a bit of PowerPoint and a bit of R, you know, uh, etc. Um, so what I'll do is hand over to, to Sarah now, and uh, I'll start going quiet. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay, I'll start sharing the screen. I uh, just want to maybe make sure that you're all on mute. Um, if you've got any questions, you can pop them in the chat as we go along. Okay, can you all see my screen okay? Bro, okay. Okay, so yeah, first of all, a massive thanks uh, for coming and a massive thanks to uh, SciPag and BPS as well for organizing this uh, really great event. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here as well. I'm on delivering this session and talking about, well, simulating response accuracy data at the item level using a logistic multi-level model. Um, yeah, so briefly, like Ollie said, I'm a third year PhD student at Lancaster and super by, supervised by um, two excellent doctors, Rob, Rob Davies and Debbie Costain. Um, my background isn't in mathematics or statistics, but I'm lucky enough to have had some time to be able to learn the stuff um, that we're going to go through today. So in terms of the timetable, um, we're going to have this sort of uh, brief introduction um, before we get to it. Uh, and then we're going to get like a, a, a big chunk of content and then we'll have like a five minute break, um, if possible, a 10 minute break. But we'll see how we go for time um, and then another chunk of content and then we'll finish. Um, and as we go through, we'll be doing a bit uh, in PowerPoint and then a little bit in R and then we'll go back again. <sighs> and like I said, if you have any questions at any point and just pop them in the chat. Um, and when we get to the point where we're about to change to R, then we'll just have a look at if there's any questions that need answering at that point. Okay, so a forward, word, there's a very, very, very small chance that my internet, internet might um, drop off for a couple of minutes. If it does, it'll only be a couple, like three minutes or so, uh, and I will, I will be back. Um, so, so don't worry if that happens, but fingers crossed, we'll be fine. So what we're going to cover are going to be some uh, theoretical and practical elements of uh, logistic and multi-level regression. Um, we're going to look at sort of simulating data, of course, and estimating power. Um, and we're going to do this all through the lens of a hypothetical study, because I think it's helpful sometimes to have a more concrete example when you're learning sort of new concepts and that kind of thing. Um, we're going to go a little bit mathsier than we have done um, in previous sessions. And that's just because when we get more complicated models, it becomes really difficult to express what we mean in a really concise way without using a little bit of sort of like mathematical syntax. Um, so if it's something that you're not particularly familiar with or comfortable with, then uh, just hold out because uh, the payoff is, is worth the effort in the end. Um, and of course, these slides are gonna be available so you can go through it in your own time um, and spend a little bit more time on those complex elements. Okay, so why simulate? Obviously like, yeah, preaching to the choir, like Ollie said. Um, Yeah, so why simulate? It's a valuable learning tool um, to evaluate experimental design and to construct a statistical theoretical model is another reason. So if you had like a, a particular opinion about how maybe some uh, phenomenon was being was occurring, you could produce a statistical model and simulate from that to test your predictions if you wanted to. Um, simulation is also used in lots of other fields as well. So like operational research uses a whole different kind of, kind of simulation. Um, so like simulating the, the throughput of uh, ventilators in a factory, for example. So we're looking at a particular type of simulation here um, for sort of experimental design. In terms of caveats though, there are some, uh, and we know that all simulations are wrong and some are more so, to paraphrase George Box, we're never gonna get things right and simulation models are never gonna be perfectly accurate. Um, so that's always a massive caveat. Um, and also perfect imitation doesn't mean perfect explanation. So in this example here, I could do a really, really good job at predicting one variable by using the observations of the other. That doesn't mean that I've learned anything about the way that that variable is being created. I've learned nothing about its sort of data generating process, or whatever you want to call it. So I can have like predictive validity, but I can't necessarily have theoretical validity while I'm doing that. Okay, 
There's also some warnings. Um, so some assumptions in simulations are, are pretty sneaky. Uh, they're not obvious. Uh, so watch out for these because some can be wrong. Uh, and sometimes even like quite innocuous ones can be pretty wrong. Um, and also no simulation can make up for measurement problems. So if you're doing a simulation to uh, calculate power and your power is great, well, that's good. But if you measure lacks any sort of validity, um, then you can't really make the conclusions that, that you might want to make, even if you've got really good power. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, having said those, um, let's crack on and actually uh, do some simulation eventually. <laughs> okay, so here's my sort of hypothetical study. Um, so we've got the question, how does or how do private tutoring and the number of days absent from school affect a child's performance in an end of year reading ability task? So hopefully this is a kind of research question that maybe you can see some parallels between your own design um, and you might be able to adapt elements of this, but hopefully it's concrete enough that everyone can kind of see where we're going to go with this. We're going to have this design where we're going to take a sample of schools um, and from each school we're going to take a sample of pupils. So it's this multi-level structure in terms of how we're sampling. Um, and then for each pupil, we're going to have um, an observation of whether or not uh, they receive tutoring and whether or not, I'm sorry, how many days they're absent from the school. And then we're going to see these observations of responses to comprehension questions on that reading ability test. So obviously multi-level design here. Um, and that's what we're going to build towards doing in our simulation. So by the end, we'll be able to simulate data for this design. In terms of getting there, we're going to uh, sort of step through complexity. So we're going to start with a really, really basic model that's not got basically anything in it. Uh, and then we're going to add in some uh, quote unquote random intercept variances. Then we're going to add some predictors or some effects. Uh, and then we're going to add the random effect variances. OK. So every simulation needs a, a so-called data generating model or mechanism, whatever you want to refer to it as, which just describes the process by which the simulated data is created. So we can base our data generating model on a statistical model if we wanted to and use random sampling from a probability distribution to simulate that data. So the usual pipeline is that we have our observed empirical data, we fit some model that we think explains the process by that that is created, and then we get those parameter estimates. We can just reverse the pipeline to simulate by feeding in some parameter values into a statistical model and simulating data from that. So there's effectively this link between simulation and analysis. So often when you might consider, well, how do I simulate my data? You can kind of answer that question by thinking, well, how would I analyze it? So we'll briefly sort of recap the standard linear regression, which is really helpful that Andy um, already covered that this week. So if you went to that session, this is going to be really good. So one of the benefits here that we're going to sort of look at what Andy looked at, but in slightly different syntax in terms of mathematically. So if you can map on what he was saying to what is going on here, it's going to help basically. Okay, so the standard linear model, or if you want to call it the general linear model, estimates that linear relationship between some predictor or predictors um, and an outcome variable, so some IVs and a DV. And we know these have got these very familiar assumptions about normality of residuals, homogeneity of variance, that linear relationship, um, and independence of observations and like, random sampling and so forth, so on. Um, we know that the test, the t-test and the ANOVA and the regression, they're all related. So they're all kind of underpinned by the same linear model. So a t-test uh, is basically kind of an ANOVA and ANOVA is a kind of a regression. They're just generalizations of them. So if you've done one of these, you've done a linear model at some point. So let's look at an example. So say that we've got this, um, this drug that increases height. So I'm a ph pharmaceutical company. And I've just created this drug that is going to increase people's height. And I want to know, does it work kind of thing? Um, so my, my DV, my outcome variable is going to be height. And my IV is going to be group. And people are either going to be in a control group or a treatment group. So they're either going to not receive this drug or they're going to receive the drug. Now, in terms of the assumptions that we make for our linear model, we kind of say, well, at the population level, each of those two groups is normally distributed in terms of height. So the control group has a bunch of people at the population level that has some mean and some standard deviation. And the treatment group also has some mean and some standard deviation, but the means are different between them. But if that's the little one subscript here, so this is a one particular mean, and this is another particular mean. So they've got different means. And we could imagine that maybe the mean of the control group is about 170, which is pretty much the average height. Um, and then the mean of the treatment group is 200 for say. Um, so there's like a 30% difference, sorry, 30 centimeter difference. So let's imagine our, our drug actually does increase height by 30 centimeters. And then this sigma part uh, is the same. And that's that homogeneity of variance assumption. We're saying that the spread of these distributions is the same. Um, and then we're just gonna set this to 11, which is 
more or less what it could be in terms of what the, what the spread would be. So those are the assumptions that we're making at the population level about those two groups and what height looks like and how it's distributed at them in them at the population level. In terms of expressing that as a model, this is where it's going to get a little bit more mathsy. So if we say that I index is an individual, so an individual that we've sampled and G index is the group, then we can say that the observation of an individual in a group is normally distributed and the mean of that distribution depends on the group and the variance is the same or the standard deviation is the same for the groups. There's no index here. And then this is the linear model part. This observation IG of the individual in a group has some intercept value. It has some effective group where group is a binary variable. It's either zero or one in our data frame. And then we've got some variance here that we're adding on, which is specific for an individual in a group. And then we say that individual in a group variance is normally distributed with mean zero and this sigma, the standard deviation. So this is kind of just a bit that's added on after we've got this mean part here and this effective group. So in this situation, the, the beta zero, the intercept, is the mean of the control group. And beta one is the difference between the mean of the control group and the mean of the treatment group. Um, OK, so say we had data like this uh, based on that 170 and two, 200 centimeters between the groups. We could fit a model in R. Um, so we'd have this, uh, this model syntax, and we fit this linear model. Uh, so our observations of height for our participants and this predictor of group. If we get the summary of that, then it gives us the summary of the model. Um, and down here is where we've got our coefficients for the effects. And the intercept is estimated to be about 170 centimeters, which is basically what we, we said a minute ago. Uh, and the group is estimated to be about 30 centimeters. So there's that difference in height. Um, so the intercept is the mean of the treatment group. And the, the group effect is the difference between the treatment and the intercept, the control group mean. And then down here, we've got the residual standard error, which is the sigma, the standard deviation part. And that's the same for both groups. That's that homogeneity of uh, variance assumption. And these map on directly to those uh, statements about the population that we made uh, a couple of slides before. So we said that the control group is normally distributed with some mean and some sigma. The treatment group is normally distributed with some mean and some sigma. And then we had this model where each observation for an individual in a group is this linear combination of some intercepts, some effective group and some variance, which itself is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation sigma. So we take these estimates and they're just literally the values of them. And we can plug in the mean is just the 170 part. The mean of group two is these two added together. It's the difference in the means plus the, the base mean, if you will, the baseline. Uh, and then the sigma of those uh, is 11.4. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and just to get you a bit more familiar with some of the, the syntax we'll be using here. Okay, so in any linear, yeah, any linear regression, I guess any regression in general, um, we have two key components. Uh, we have a probability distribution, and that's the, the population distribution that we kind of like assume we're sampling from. And we have a link function, which links the predictors, so the bits in our linear model, to the parameters of that probability distribution. And to see what I mean, so for that standard linear model we just had, that probability distribution was the normal or the Gaussian distribution. And it has those two parameters, which are mean and standard deviation or mu and sigma. And the link function, which we don't usually talk about, is called an identity function. And that, that maps the predictors onto mu or the mean in a standard linear model. That identity function literally just means that everything's on the scale which it already applies on. So that 170 centimeters that was estimated in the intercept summary, that's literally the value of the mean. There's no transformation. The numbers in the model summary are the numbers that you can interpret in terms of that probability distribution. But what we are gonna be looking at is the logistic model. So the probability distribution here is a Bernoulli distribution. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. And it has this parameter called theta. And it has a link function called the logit function or the logit function, uh, which maps our linear predictors onto that theta part. So we'll talk about the probability distribution and then we'll talk about this link function. So the Bernoulli distribution, which is named after uh, Mr. Jacob Bernoulli here, he looks very fetching, um, is a probability distribution with, uh, which sort of describes an event with two discrete outcomes, which are usually labeled like zero and one. But that's kind of arbitrary. You could label them however you want, as long as the outcome only has two possible um, alternative option outcomes. So the parameter that theta, sometimes labeled a P instead, that's the probability of, of getting a one. Or if you imagine a coin flip and you said one is heads and zero is tails, that's the probability of getting the heads. So here, if you say that theta is 0.5 or the probability is 0.5 of getting a heads, 
well, you're going to get heads 50% of the time if you sort of flip the coin infinitely. That's what the distribution tells you. In terms of writing a Bernoulli model a little bit more mathematically, we could say for any coin flip i, so it's sort of like an instance of a coin flip, this is Bernoulli distributed with this parameter theta. And theta is the probability that that coin flip is a heads. So just a second ago, we had, okay, let's have the probability of the coin flip being heads as five. So 50% of the time, we're gonna see heads. But say we have a bias coin and the probability uh, of getting heads is 0.75. It's pretty uh, intuitive then. 75% of the time, we're going to see heads when we flip a coin. Okay. There is a related distribution, which is called the binomial distribution. Uh, and it will become clear in a little while why, why I'm mentioning this here. Um, and the binomial distribution is basically a sum of Bernoulli's. So it's the sum of outcomes of a series of Bernoulli events with, with two outcomes. So it's basically like flipping a coin a few times and then counting how many heads, you, heads and tails you got. Um, and it has two parameters. It's got n, which is literally the number of trials, the number of times you flip in a coin, uh, and theta, that probability of, of seeing the heads. So here, for example, uh, n is three. So we're doing sort of three flips of a coin. So say we get like a heads and then a tails and a heads, and then we just count how many heads we've got. And that number of the count is what is the Bernoulli distribution. It's a little bit weird, I think, to get your head around to start with. Um, so yeah, it's a count of the Bernoullis. In terms of writing that mathematically, uh, we could say uh, for a total number of heads on some time that we're going to flip a coin a bunch of times, um, those are binomially distributed um, with this trial size and this uh, probability of seeing a heads. Um, so the probability of seeing a heads on any given coin flip is theta again, and the n is the number of trials that we're doing. So for example here, say that the probability of seeing a heads on any single coin flip is 0.5, so we've got a fair coin, and say we flip that coin 10 times, well, this is the probability distribution of how many times we'd expect to see a heads. So obviously it's a fair coin, flipping it 10 times, we're going to expect to see heads half of the time, so the most probable value is 5. It's going to be super rare that we get a 10, 10 heads, that's, that's unusual, and it's also going to be really weird if we get 10 tails. That's basically the binomial. So the reason I'm talking about the binomial is because there's this overlap with the Bernoulli. So if we say y, whatever y is, uh, is a variable distributed binomial with uh, these parameters n and theta. If we say that the number of times we're flipping a coin is just once, then actually that variable is a Bernoulli distribution. Because if you think you're flipping a coin once and then counting how many heads you get, you can only either have zero or one. So you just end up back with a Bernoulli distribution. So sometimes people refer to the Bernoulli distribution as a binomial with trial size one. Um, in R, when we look at it, that's what we're going to be technically sampling from. But sometimes this does vary between packages. Sometimes they call it Bernoulli. Sometimes they call it bino binomial trial size one. Just so you're familiar with what's going on. Okay, uh, now the logit link function. Think for <laughs> logit link function part. Okay, so the logit link function takes the probability of getting a one and uh, returns continuous uh, minus infinity to positive infinity values. Um, it's actually really useful because it means we can uh, model our effects. Um, we can, they can take any range in our, our model. Those values could be, they're not constrained. But then once we transform them back into like observations, then we are bounded between zero and one. We don't end up with like weird negative values. We end up with something that looks like binary data. Um, the logic function changes how we interpret our model estimates. Um, and that's in terms of our effects, uh, our intercepts and our variances. So we need to understand this part to be able to sort of simulate from the model. It sounds kind of complicated, but it's not. Um, the logic function is literally the log of the odds of getting a one. So in terms of the steps to calculate the, the logit, um, you would take the, the probability of getting a one, so count how many times you see a one out of the number you can. Um, calculate that as an odds. So if you're kind of into gambling, then odds ratios and that kind of thing will be quite familiar. Um, and then you just take the natural logarithm of that. Um, so that's like a, just a button on the calculator, basically. Um, and that's kind of all there is to the logic function. Uh, it's quite a neat little thing. So it changes these zeros and ones into this big range of uh, continuous values. OK, so an example, say that our probability of getting a one is 0.9. So we've got a super, super biased coin now. We're almost always going to see heads. What's the logic of it? Well, the probability is 0.9. The odds of that is 0.9 divided by 1 minus 0.9 for the odds. So the odds of that is 9. And then we just take the log of it. And the log of 9 is about 2.2. 2. 
you don't have to do this by hand. So in R, there's this uh, library called Psych, which isn't one of the libraries I put on the information. So I apologize, uh, but we will be using this. It's only a small library, I think, um, which contains these two functions, uh, logit and logistic. The logit function goes from probability to log odds, and the logistic function goes to log odds to probability. So really handy. Saves a little bit of time for um, not making quite as many mistakes, hopefully. Uh, in terms of model fitting, so if you wanted to fit a logistic model, you don't need to apply this function. It's all sort of done internally, um, and there's nothing for you to, to really do. You just apply those zeros and ones, and the model takes care of the rest. But for simulation, we need to simulate log odds units and then convert them to probability, and then simulate from the model. So let's do that. So getting back to where we started. So we had this question, how do private tutoring and the number of days absent from school affect a child's performance on an end of year reading ability task? Bit of a mouthful. So our outcome is gonna be this response to this reading ability task and they're gonna either get it wrong or they're gonna get it right. And our design is gonna be that sample of responses uh, to questions from pupils in some school. So we're gonna use this kind of uh, indexing. We're gonna say the response of pupil P to, uh, from school S to question Q. So P is pupil, S is school, Q is question. Okay. In terms of sample sizes, I'm just going to pick some kind of arbitrary numbers here. Um, just say that this is, I don't know how many schools, 10 schools signed up, and then at each school, we're just going to take one grade or one year or one class of 25 pupils. So we've got 25 pupils, 10 schools, and our reading ability test has 30 questions on it. And those pupils and schools are going to do the same questions. So all in all, we're going to have seven and a half thousand observations. So not, not a small amount, a nice decent sized study, I would say. Okay, so let's consider a really basic model and put those parts together that we were just talking about a minute ago. So we can say for where P, the pupil, is like indexed from 1 to 25, so for each of our pupils, and where school is the index from 1 to 10 for each of our 10 schools, and where question Q is from 1 to 30, so indexing each of those questions, then we can express this model. So we can say the response of a pupil from a school to a question is binomially distributed and with this parameter theta. And that parameter theta is the probability of that response being correct. And then this part is where the linear model is going to come in. So we're going to take the log odds of the probability of that response being correct. And that's where we're going to have our linear model part. And at the moment, we're just kind of a really, really basic one. We've just got an intercept in there. And that's the, 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 the log odds of getting a question right. Because all this is going to be on the log odds scale. Hope that makes sense. OK. so. How do we select what this parameter should be, this, this beta zero, this intercept value? Well, practically speaking, we can just specify a probability, because I think it's quite easy to think on a probability scale than a log odds scale, and then convert that to a log odds. But theoretically speaking, how do we specify the intercept? Uh, that's, that's the tricky part. So it would be great if we had previous research or some data available, if there's any kind of similar task uh, that's out there in existence, if we had some pilot data, uh, then we could use that for information. If we lacked anything, then we could just sort of select a range of plausible values and, and take a look at see what that looks like. Um, this is obviously one of the sticking points of any simulation, picking parameter values, and it's ne there's never an easy answer to that question, um, other than just consider whether they're reasonable and then consider a range. So um, we might say that a plausible value is like 50% chance of getting a question right. So then we would say, okay, so that's the probability, 0.5. If we take the log odds of that to convert it into an odds, then we get this zero. So this, this is the log odds of getting a question right. Um, and it seems a bit weird to go from 0.5 to zero, uh, but this conversion graph sort of shows where we're at, at that point in the conversion. So when probability is 0.5, log odds is zero. If we were much higher up, like a probability of like 0.99, then we get to like a log odds of around four. Okay, so in terms of putting it into R, um, we're gonna create a data frame that matches our experimental design that we've just talked about a few minutes ago. We're then going to create that log odds for each response. Then we're going to convert that into probability and then sample from that Bernoulli distribution uh, with that probability. So uh, let's do that. So there's a link here. If you could put that in the chat, I'd be very grateful. Uh, we can just go and download that R script. And if you do click on the link, then you'll go to this page here if you just click download and open that in R. 
and then we'll take a look at an hour in a second. But first, we'll just take a look if there's any questions in chat. None so far, but um, if anyone does know, that'd be a great time to, to post them. <laughs> the terrifying thumb. Yeah, yeah it's, it's creepy, isn't it? No. Okay, so open R. Okay, so is the zoom okay on this or do we need it a bit more zoomed? I'm going to take that as a yes, it's okay. Okay. So uh, when you first open this uh, R script, if you take the Sorry, outline. Sorry, asked for a bit more, a, bit, a, little, a little bit more zoom. A little bit more, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's really zoomy. That's actually not that much more. It's a little bit more. Hopefully it's a bit better. I'll see if you could change it to a white background as well. If that's yeah, I was just wondering that as well. Might appear a, bit, a little bit better. Thank, uh, thank, thanks for the comment. There we go. Okay, oh, you can barely see that. It's so gray. <laughs> Sorry. What's a good one that's got really good uh, contrast? Mm. Xcode. So it's showing. It should be right one. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's good. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So when you open the script, if you click on the outline button, then it's going to show you the, the seven little chunks in R that we've got to go through. Uh, right now, we're just going to look at this basic model one. Uh, before we do that, um, right now, we only need the uh, the psych and the L, uh, the GG plot library, I think. So you can run those if you want, or you can run all of them. It's up to you. I'm just going to run all uh, to make sure I've got them all loaded so I don't forget later on and get an error. Okay, so um, here, if I pull this to the side a little bit, we've got this uh, basic model that we've just uh, looked at a second ago, where we've got these responses to questions being Bernoulli distributed with this parameter theta, which is the probability of that response being correct. Uh, and then our logit of that, the log odds of the probability of getting it correct, uh, is just given by beta zero. That's all that's in the model. And our beta zero, we're going to say, is uh, the logit of 0.5, so the log odds of 0.5 probability. Our design, like we said, we're going to have 30 questions, 25 pupils from 10 schools. And that's basically we're just declaring the things that we've said before. So the first step here is what I'm going to do is going to create some uh, objects in the R environment, which capture these numbers, basically. So if I run this line, then in your environment, you're going to have this value, which you can see here. Uh, and if you just ran this bit and didn't create the object, then we just see we get a printout of it being zero. That's that log odds of 0.5. Okay, then I'm going to create an object for the number of pupils, which is 25, for schools, which is 10, and for questions, which is 30. But I'm also going to create an extra variable called the number of pupils total, which is just going to be the number of pupils times the number of schools, because I'm doing 25 pupils from each of 10 schools. So this is going to be 250. So have a look down here, and pupils total is 250. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is going to create this data frame which matches the design um, that, that we wanted. So I'm going to create this sim data frame, sim DF, uh, as a data frame of three columns, one for pupil, one for school, one for question. And I'm using this uh, REP repeat function to repeat the each of the number of pupils over the number of questions. And then the same with school, repeat the number of schools, but repeat each one for the number of pupils answering the number of questions. I'll just run this and show you what I mean. So we end up with this data frame where we've got a uh, pupil going down, school going down, question going down, and each row is a pupil from a school answering a question. So the first 30 rows that you're going to see is the first pupil answering the, th the 30 questions. Then after that, you'll get pupil two. If we scroll down here, there we go. So pupil two then starts answering those 30 questions. So uh, the first 25 pupils are all going to be from school one. The next 25 are going to be from school two, et cetera. Um, it's always worth checking that you've done this right because it's really easy to get it wrong. Um, there's other ways you can do it. So sometimes you can do like grid expand if you had a, a fully sort of like repeated design. Um, whatever creates this best and easiest, I find the repeat function quite handy. But yeah, like I said, always check that you've got what you wanted. Okay, so then I'm going to add a column for the, 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 the one component in our model, the intercept. So I'm just going to add that in. 
So when we look back at our data frame, we've got this beta zero, which is a whole column of zeros because that intercept applies to everyone and it's just zero, the log odds of that probability of 0.5. Okay, and then I'm gonna uh, calculate the, the log odds of each row, which right now seems really stupid because the log odds is only zero, there's, there's nothing else going on. But when we add some more parts uh, in the next section, then this becomes a little bit more of a reasonable thing to do. So obviously if we ran this log odds creation column, all we've got in there is the intercept. So it's just gonna be a copy of this column basically, but later on it's gonna contain more stuff. We're then gonna convert that log odds to a probability. Like we said, we need to have its probability to sample from that Bernoulli distribution. So we're gonna apply the logistic function to the log odds, which uh, to no surprise should give us 0.5, which it does, which is always really reassuring. So it's always worth checking you're getting these numbers that you expect. So everyone down here has 0.5. Um, we're then going to do the simulation part. So we're going to sample from that Bernoulli distribution, or AKA a binomial with a trial size of one. So we create this column called response, which is a simulation from an, a binomial, a random draw from a binomial distribution. And the number of samples we're doing is just going to be the number of rows in our data frame, because we know there's as many rows as there are pupils responses. And the trial size is going to be one, so it's like that one Bernoulli trial. And the probability is going to be the probability in the data frame. So if we run that and have a look, then for each response here, then we've got this observation of a zero or one. So uh, on the first question, people one got it right. The second question, they got wrong. Next one, they got right, right, wrong, wrong, etc. Cool. So we can take a look at the histogram of that response. Let's make this a little bit bigger before we do. Uh, it's pretty uninspiring and there's not a lot you can really tell other than Yep, there's zeros and ones in there. Uh, and on average, we should get about 0.5 because that's our probability. So we should see half the time people are getting it right, half the time people are getting it wrong. And if we take the mean, we should be about 0.5 and we are, so that's great. Uh, we do have like seven and a half thousand observations. So that's a pretty good number uh, to be able to estimate the probability of doing that. So we've done it. We've created this basic model. We've simulated from it. Uh, happy days, we've got some simulated data. What you might've noticed, it's a little bit basic. So let's go back to those slides. I should just ask, has anyone got any questions at that point? Anyone having trouble with the script? Cool, okay. Ooh. Right then. So let's get back into it. So, oh, that's the start. <laughs> let's try again. Okay. So the basic model, it was bad. Maybe it didn't seem bad, but it was because this model is saying that every pupil has the same chance of getting it right. Every school has the same kind of pupils and every question is the same kind of difficulty. And that's pretty bad. We're effectively treating uh, pupils responses to questions as like flipping a coin. Um, and in terms of what we actually think is going on in creating those responses to the questions, it's not very realistic. So we can do a lot better than this model. Um, and, and we should really, we, we need to take into account the fact that pupils are different and schools are different and, and questions are different. So what we have here is multi-level observations. Um, so if you take the sort of analogy of a cake stand with some nice afternoon tea, uh, the things on one level are more similar to each other other than things on other levels. So the cakes are more similar to other cakes on the cake level and sandwiches are more sandwiches, so similar to sandwiches on the sandwich level, which is a good thing that they're nested like that because you really don't want tuna uh, on your cake. So the model that we just had a second ago completely ignores this. Uh, and that's bad because when we have this nested data, then we end up with sort of these, these correlated residuals. So we're not sort of having independent observations that are completely independent of each other. We have this nesting that means my response is more similar to my other responses than your responses are. So to turn this into a multi-level model, we're just gonna add these random intercept variances here. So the bits that are in blue is what's new. We've still got the probability of a response theta uh, being correct. And then we're taking the logit of that, um, that parameter theta and expressing it as a linear model. And now instead of just having an intercept, we've got this plus u0p, which is pupil variance in the log odds of getting it right, u0s, which is school variance in the log odds of getting it right, and u0q, which is question variance in the log odds of getting it right. So you can kind of imagine uh, the pupil variances as like, some pupils are a little bit more able, some people are a little bit less able. 
some school variants you could think of as maybe some schools have better teachers than others. So those teachers are, are doing a better job of educating the pupils than maybe some others are. It's an assumption. I'm not saying it's true. Um, and then this question variants you can kind of think of as some questions are really easy, some questions are really hard. There's variability there. They're not all the same. I guess if you had an ideal sort of uh, measure, then you would have very little question variants. But in reality, we know on tests that they are variable. OK. In terms of how we talk about multi-level models, we often talk about a fixed part and a random part. And the fixed part is like the betas part. They're fixed because they're just a number. They don't, they don't change. They're the same for everyone. They're just a number. But the random parts are random because they're probabilistic. So they're different for, for each person and they're assumed to be drawn from a probabilistic distribution. So we assume them to be observations from normal distributions. So Pupil variance is like a, a sample from a normal distribution, and it has a mean of zero and some standard deviation. If you notice, all of these have means of zero. So all of these variances vary around the intercept. And what I mean by that is that because we have this mean of zero, mean of zero, mean of zero, and some sigma, the intercept ends up taking on a meaning as being the average log odds of getting it right so for the average person on the average text sorry from the average school to the average question then they have this probability of getting it right or the log odds of the probability of getting it right so how do we decide what those sigmas are because in terms of parameterizing this model we don't actually select the values for u0 p and s and q etc we're actually going to select the sigmas because we create these by randomly sampling from a normal distribution. So like we've looked at in uh, previous sessions, we're going to use our norm function to create these, these deviates. Um, so we need to select the standard deviations. So what should they be? Uh, just a note to say that, like we said at the very start, in the logistic model, everything's in log odds units. So the intercepts in log odds units, the uh, effects are in log odds units, and the variances are going to be in log odds units. So the things that we draw from these distributions, these U0Ps and Ss and Qs, are going to already be assumed to be in log odds units. So sigma magnitude. We know that the bigger sigma is, the bigger the spread. Um, so here we've got this uh, 0.25, which is really clustered uh, nice and tightly around zero. We've got the standard normal, um, of standard deviation of one. And then we've got this uh, much bigger sigma, which on this scale almost looks flat from minus three to three, but it's not flat. If we zoomed out, we'd see the rest of it. Um, but more specifically, um, we know that for roughly between plus or minus one standard deviations, you're going to see about 68% of um, all the distribution in that probability, uh, all the distributions, all the probability in the distribution is, is going to fall within that range. Uh, between Plus or minus two standard deviations, you're going to see like 95% of the values of that distribution. And the, the, the tails beyond three standard deviations are only a very, very small percentage, less than 5%. So we could just pick a particular sigma for an example here to see whether we think it's reasonable or not. So let's say that we pick a sigma of one. So we've got this normal distribution mean zero, standard deviation one for, for pupil variance. So we're going to say individual variances are sampled from that distribution. If we do the maths and if we imagine that we, we sample twice, we have this pupil A and this pupil B. So let's say pupil A is above average. They have this uh, extra deviation of 1.5 log odds. So they get a little bit extra chance of getting the question right. And pupil B is less lucky. So they get this uh, minus 3.2, which is pretty rare under the normal distribution, that observation. So if we assume that the intercept is that 0.5 probability, 50% chance of getting it right, that gives us a log odds of zero. We can then calculate each pupil's general probability of getting a question right if you ignore the, the schools and any other effects in, in that model. So what's their average probability of getting a question right? So we can say the probability that the response was correct for pupil A, given that it's pupil A, we take the inverse logit of the log odds, so we transform back from log odds to probability, and they get 0.82, so 82%. They get an extra 32% on this baseline 50% chance. So yeah, they're above average. They're doing well. But the probability of the response being correct for pupil B, uh, we take the inverse logit of that. So we've got this, the log odds of 0.5, which is zero. Take away their deviate, 2.2. Um, they get this probability, so 0 0.04. Uh, so like a 4% chance of getting the question right, which is uh, quite, a, quite a big 46% chance less. So you can imagine this is like a more able pupil, uh, and this pupil's really not doing well. Um, but also in logistic models, there's this extra slight complexity. When we think about the meaning of these deviates, it's sort of slightly tied to the intercept. Everything's relative to where that is when we talk about what probability is. 
So if we change this slightly, we still have the same deviates here, but let's say that on average for an average pupil from an average school to an average question, the probability of getting it right is 80%. So let's say in general, the test is easy. So the logit of that is 1.37. If we put that number into the equations and we keep these deviates the same, we get this 1.37 plus 1.5 inverse logit, we get this 0.95. So here we're getting 15% extra. And if you recall from the slide before, we had 32% extra. So the difference depends a little bit on where the intercept is when we're calculating the probability. For this person here, pupil B, uh, we put this, this different number in, this 80% chance in logits, uh, minus their 3.2 deviate, uh, and their percentage chance of getting it right is 14%. Uh, so they, they see a bigger drop. So it's worth bearing that in mind that sometimes um, the, the probability of something depends on where the intercept is because this transformation between log odds to probability isn't linear. So sometimes you also need to consider that when you're thinking about effects and whether they're a reasonable sigma or not. Okay, so for argument's sake, say that we selected these sigmas. I'm not basing this on research. Uh, this isn't my area of expertise. Um, and let's say I've been particularly lazy and I've not even tried to find any information. So I'm really just uh, selecting these for convenience here. Um, but they're numbers that I would, I would say generally they're not unreasonable. Uh, they're not crazy big and they're not crazy small. Um, so they're, they're okay numbers, they're, they're somewhat plausible. But if I was actually doing this properly, then I've definitely not done due diligence here. So let's say uh, the variance for a pupil is normal mean zero standard deviation one. We're going to say schools are a little bit less variable, so maybe the quality of teaching doesn't really differ too much between schools, but there is some noise. Uh, so their standard deviation is going to be 0.5. And we'll say that questions are a little bit noisy too, as noisy as pupils say. Maybe that's not a reasonable assumption. Maybe it is. Depends on the test. Um, and we'll say that their standard deviation is 1. Okay, so now we can put that in R. So if you would mind popping that link in the chat again in case people haven't got it, uh, we'll have a look and do that in R now. Oh yeah, are there any questions as well at this point? I think we're okay, okay. So in the R script where I'm just gonna clear out uh, just a little bit here. You don't have to clear everything if you, if you don't want to, it's just to, uh, to neaten things up a little bit. Okay, so we go to section two. This is the multi-level model part. I'll just pull this across. Then we've got this, um, this model that we just talked about a minute ago. So we've got this basic multi-level model where we've got the response of a pupil uh, from a school to a question is Bernoulli distributed with this uh, parameter theta, which is the probability that the response is correct. And then the, lo the log odds of that, or the logit function of that um, is where the linear model is. That intercept plus some pupil variance, plus some school variance, plus some question variance. And I'm just making a note here of the things that we said, how they were distributed and what those sigmas were. Just like before, we've got the same design, same number of pupils, schools, and questions. So again, the first thing I'm going to do is create uh, those values of objects in the environment because I'll need to refer to them. So I'm just going to go ahead and run those three. All right, so over here, we've got them there. So the intercept again is just that log odds of 0.5, which is zero. And then we've got these, these three sigmas. Okay add in the numbers for the pupils of number of pupils and schools and questions, and then the total pupils. And then again, we're going to create this data frame with those three columns, uh, which just index uh, how many pupils, how many schools, how many questions. So we take a look, it's exactly the same as before, nothing's changed here. Um, now in our linear model, we've got this little bit extra, and these, these random intercept variances. We're still going to have this fixed element, so I'm going to add that to a column in there. And then for those random elements, if you remember, we were said that we were, there were samples from normal distributions. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to create some, um, some objects which are like lists or vectors um, of those random deviates. So U0P is going to be samples from a random normal distribution. Sorry, random samples from a normal distribution. I'm going to do that for the total number of pupils because I want one for each pupil. The mean is going to be zero and the standard deviation is that sigma we selected a minute ago. So if I run that, then here we get this list of numbers. And if I type it in, then it prints out what those are. So if you take a look at, scroll to the top. So you can see pupil one, um, they were minus 1.6. So they were below average, you could say, in terms of ability or just generally in terms of uh, the log odds of getting it right, they're below average. We'll do the same for schools uh, and put the sigmas that we selected for them in as well. 
and the same for questions. So we end up with these three uh, vectors of deviates for pupils, scores, and questions. So since those numbers differ for each pupil, school, and question, and we want to put them into the data frame, we need to be careful that we do match up those numbers correctly. Um, so we do the repeats in the right places. Um, generally speaking, one way to make sure that we put things in the right place is to use the same sort of format that we use when we create that design data frame. So at the top, when we said repeat pupils each for how many times they answer a question, then it's kind of the same thing in that we're repeating the variances each for the number of times that they're answering a question. But if you want to uh, use other approaches, you can. So you like left join or merge or that kind of thing, um, where you can name variables to make sure that, that they're mapped on correctly. Whichever way you use, always check that they're, they've sort of transferred properly. So if we have a look in this data frame now, if you remember the first pupil was this minus 1.6, um, the code makes sure that we're matching up against that pupil. So this minus 1.6 is repeated for that pupil's 30 question responses. And then after the 30th question, we get this new deviate for the second person. And if we have a look at what that was, it should be 1.27, it is, so that's great. The school deviate is repeated uh, for each school. So after the first 25 pupils, this number will change to the second number, which would be the 0 0.32. So we can scroll down and take a look and check what pupil will be on the three. So obviously there's uh, more efficient ways of checking. Um, but if you just want to do a quick check. Uh, yeah, so we're at 0 0.325. And then question variances, that just loops through the questions. Um, so the first question variance is 1.45, the next one's minus 4.7, and that'll repeat for the next pupil. So it'll start here again at 1.45 and then minus 0.47. Okay, so we've added those deviates into the data frame, which is great. Uh, so the next step is to calculate the, the log odds column, which before we just had this intercept, but now we're going to add in these deviates as well. So if we run that and take a look in our data frame, then this log odds column is just summing across these rows. So we've got uh, these columns, sorry. We've got the intercept, which is nothing. And then we're just adding up each of these deviates. So this is each response's log odds, basically. So for any pupil from a school answering a question, this is the log odds of the response being correct. So then convert that to a probability using the logistic function and take another look. And these are the probabilities. Okay. And then the next step, as we know, is to put that probability into a binomial distribution with a trial size of one, so a Bernoulli sample, uh, to get those response observations. So take a look. Uh, this, <laughs> this first person didn't do well. Um, despite uh, chance being on the side here, uh, they still got it wrong. And just in general, actually, the probability is pretty low um, for them. So that's, that's not great. Uh, but I guess the, the random deviate is below average. So yep, they're just not getting questions right. Uh, if we look at the histogram for that, uh, make it big enough to plot, first of all. There we go. Uh, we still see this even amount of zeros and ones. And that's because on average, the probability is 0.5. So those random deviates are centered at zero. So even though people, are, some people are a little bit higher, some people are a little bit lower, they're kind of balancing each other out uh, because they're all centered on zero. So the average, the average person answering an average question uh, from an average school uh, has this 0.5-ish probability. Okay, but we can check out uh, the variability that we put in. Um, so I'm going to do a, a GG plot of a, a subset of some of these pupils, because uh, if we plot all 250, it's a little bit unmanageable to see. It's a little bit slow, but okay. So in this plot, um, each sort of box numbered one to 50, is a pupil basically and these are the the frequency counts of how many questions they got right or wrong so this person one if you remember they didn't do so well they've got a lot of zeros and they're quite a small proportion of ones Let's see your number eight's doing pretty good much bigger proportion of ones uh, a much smaller portion of zeros it's really hard not to sort of like anthropomorphize these things and just think oh you're not doing so well oh okay school variability is a lot easier to see we've only got 10 schools so it's a nice little plot so if you imagine uh, this is a school that has, uh, like, I guess, lower quality, maybe education in terms of all the pupils end up with this slightly lowered probability. You're more likely to get a question wrong if you come from school nine than you are getting a question right. Uh, there doesn't seem to be one that's particularly higher. Five is a little bit higher. So this, if you come from this school, you're going to have a, a slightly better probability of getting a question right. 
than wrong. Okay, and then question variability, pretty intuitive. You can think of like question difficulty. Let's just let that load. So question one is a little bit easy. So the count of number of people who got this right is pretty high. Uh, not many people got it wrong. Oh, 23 is even higher. So 23 is like quite an easy question. I uh, can't see a hard one. Hmm, I guess 19 is kind of hard, seven, but there's nothing that's like really, really hard. But I guess let's just look at the draw. So we are sampling like stochastically. So on some samples, you'll get one that is almost impossible to answer correctly. Um, and sometimes you'll get one that's almost impossible to get wrong. That's, that's just how it goes. Okay, so yeah, so we've done it. We've done this multi-level model. Um, we've got these random intercept variances uh, at the level of pupil question. No, yeah, pupil question and score. Okay, cool. So at that point, it is break time. <laughs> We had a we had one question in the chat box uh, from uh, Jacqueline, which was uh, any suggestions on a more efficient ways of ensuring accuracy across deviates and pupils. But do you want do you want to come to that after the break? No, oh, no, no. We can, we can answer it now. If anyone's not interested in the answer, then go ahead and have a few extra minutes break, and we'll reconvene at two o'clock. Um, unless there's any more questions as well. So when you say uh, a more accurate way to ensure the deviates, what do you mean, if you can? If you want to post in chat or or go live, these is fine. Oh yeah, so Lisa just said yeah with some left left join. Um, yeah, the left join is quite good because you can name the columns and say uh, you match them basically. So for participant one, match with participant one. Uh, so that's a really effective way of doing it. Um, I wasn't sure if you meant sort of sampling accuracy, as in how do you always make sure that that's your standard deviation or something like that. But yeah, in terms of actually matching those columns, left join is really effective for doing that. Um, you can also sort of um, consider like if you've got the right unique numbers. Um, so for, if you think of, is it like one to two maybe? So if you take a look at these, if you, it just prints out the unique pairings of that column. So you can see everyone in school one goes up to 25 and then school two starts from 26 and down again, et cetera. Again, that's still eyeballing though. Um, and then you could do schools to questions. So school is always, um, being shown against those 10 questions because the pupils within those schools are always responding to them. But yeah, left join is the best way um, if you want to guarantee it and you don't just want to want to repeat it, uh, which is sort of, I think it's a, is it a deep layer library function even. Lisa's just put some, um, some comments uh, in the chats if anyone else is interested in doing that, uh, some step-by-step -step code. Excellent. Right, okay, yeah, break time, I guess. Thank you very much. Yeah. Get a cup of tea, uh, maybe have a, a lie down. Uh, if yeah. you want to leave at this point, that's fine. I will <laughs> we'll take you personally. Um, yeah, thank you. We'll see you at two o'clock. Okay. Okay, bro. Uh, so I hope you had a, a nice brief break. <laughs> Sorry, it's not longer, uh, but there's still plenty to go through. So now we're going to look at um, those predictors. Uh, we're going to look at power and we're going to uh, touch on slopes. We probably won't have a lot of time to look at like covariance and that kind of thing, but, but there's some in the script. So if we don't, it's still in there at least. Okay, so um, if you remember, uh, we had this research question that was how do private tutoring and the number of days absent uh, from a school year affect child's performance on an end of year reading ability task. So to be able to add predictors, we need two things. Uh, we need to have observations of those predictors, uh, like Andy was saying the other day, uh, and we need to add the effects of those predictors to the model. So there's two jobs to do here. We'll do these one at a time. We'll do the observations first, and then we'll look at the effects. So this predictor tutoring, this private tutoring measure, uh, we're just going to measure that as binary. So was tutoring received? Yes or no. Um, so in terms of like the quality of this measure, we're actually not considering how much tutoring someone had. We're not considering how good that tutoring was. We're just saying, did you have it or not? Not how many times? Who was it with? Just yes or no. So we could say that these observations of tutoring uh, are like a balanced design. We could say people are kind of like a, assigned to groups, they were tutored or they weren't. And we could have like that 50-50 uh, in the data frame. So kind of like the same way we'd um, 
assign people to treatment and control groups. But with this kind of measure, whether someone was tutored or not, we might want to consider something more probabilistic because we're kind of like taking observations. So we could kind of say that if we ask someone if they're tutored or not, it's a bit like taking a sample from a population. And then we could start to make say, statements about the population of, of what tutoring looks like. So maybe 30% maybe of the pupils in the population receive private tutoring. I don't actually know if this is true or not. Um, maybe it's actually quite a lot more. I'm not sure. I, I guess it does vary by country as well. So we could have this, this model effectively. Um, that it'd be a Bernoulli whether someone had uh, received tutoring or not. So we're going to have a model within our model, really, a model for the predictor and then a model for the outcome. So we could say that the tutoring status of pupil P is Bernoulli distributed, which you know is, is zero or one, with this parameter theta. And that theta is the probability of that, that tutoring status being one. So the probability of that child having had some tutoring. And we're going to have a model for that, um, the probability, the logit of the probability of that child having tutoring as just the intercept is B to zero. So kind of like that basic model we had a few minutes ago, but now we're just saying about the whole population of people receiving tutoring. And if we said that uh, that is just the value of the logit of 0.3, then that's like saying every pupil in the population has this chance of 30% of having had received some tutoring or not. So it might not be the best assumption. Uh, and obviously if we were doing this for real, we'd wanna do a little bit more digging uh, and not just sort of <laughs> throw wild statements around about how many people received tutoring and how many people didn't. Okay, so that's how we're gonna create our observations. So how do we put the effects in? Well, we kind of just slot them into the model that we've been building. So again, back to this uh, outcome model of response from pupil P from school S to question Q, Bernoulli distributed as we know, parameter theta. Theta is the probability that that response was correct. And then here is our linear model part, which is the log odds of that probability being correct. That answer being correct, sorry, the probability of that answer being correct. So we've got the intercept here, and then we've just slotted in this part. And this beta one, that's the value of the effect. So the change in the log odds of a one unit increase in tutoring. This tutoring is like a, that binary variable, that observation that we're gonna create. That's either a zero or a one. And then we've got our uh, random deviates here the pupil, school, and question. So we're keeping those in there. We're just adding something extra. Okay, so the unit increases thing, um, it's the same with just a, a general linear model. Um, so how much does it change by? So when tutoring is at zero, then all that we've got in that model ends up being the intercept because whatever that effect is times by zero, it's nothing. If we just ignore the random parts for a second, because we know on average, they average out to be zero, then we always just, just have this intercept. So when tutoring is zero, all we have is intercept. When tutoring is one though, so tutoring is yes, if you will, uh, then we have the intercept plus this one lot of this effect of tutoring. So the, the log odds of the probability of it being correct will be the sum of these two. Okay, so how do we decide what that value of uh, the effect of tutoring should be? Well, it's one of those problems again, one of those catch-22 situations. We don't know, we have to guess, we don't like guessing. Um, ideally, we want to base it on previous research, some source of information, some data, some related task. We could also base it on theoretical uh, expectations of what, what we think it ought to be. Um, but we could also think about other ways. Uh, if we're doing like sample size analysis, we could think about the smallest effect of interest or the smallest effect of relevance, minimally relevant difference, it's sometimes called. Uh, we can also think about the smallest effect that we could look for that we actually have resources to look for. So like that sensitivity uh, analysis kind of approach. So what can we afford to find? Um, and if all else fails, we can kind of just select um, a range of plausible values. And th to be fair, it's always good to consider a range of plausible values, even if you're just considering the smallest effect of interest anyway. Um, okay, so say that for convenience, I'm just going to select a number here. So we know that for someone who's not receiving tutoring, the average probability of getting a question right is 0.5. So that's what this, is line, this line here is saying. So the probability of that response from a pupil, from a school to a, a question, keeps saying text, sorry. Um, the probability of them getting that right, that response, given that tutoring is zero, so they didn't receive tutoring, has this probability of 0.5. So let's say that this increases to 0.65. Uh, if, if you have tutoring. So having tutoring basically increases your chance of getting something right by like 15%. So like a pretty decent chunk. So tutoring is a good thing in this situation. But we need to express this in log odds because if you remember everything in the model, or the linear part of the model is in log odds units. So we need to convert this and we need to calculate it as the difference in log odds or the change in the log odds for a one unit increase. So first of all, calculate the, the log odds of the 0.5. We know it's already zero. 
because that's what we've been working with in the model and calculate the log odds when tutoring is at a one. So that's the intercept plus the, the log odds um, for the beta one part. And that's the 0.619. So that this is basically just uh, the log odds of 0.65 from this slide. So here, the log odds of this is zero. And here, the log odds of this is 0.619. Does that make sense? So this change in the log odds for a one unit increase in tutoring takes us from zero to 0.619. And what that means is that unit increase is the coefficient, that is the effect that we need to put in our model. So beta one equals 0.619 or 0.62 for convenience. Okay, I hope that makes sense. That was a little bit unclear, sorry. So we can have a look at that in R if you've got any questions, happy to answer them. And then we'll put that predictor in. Questions at the moment. Cool. Okay, so I'll just clean up the mess. Not that it's mess, obviously, but still. Okay, so uh, section three, one predictor. So I'll just clear that away. So we've got this model that we just defined. It's the exact same as before that we've got the response, Bernoulli, theta, it's the probability getting it right. And the logic of that is the linear model part, but we've now got this extra term in here, which is this beta one times this, this tutoring observation uh, for pupil P. And again, I'm just making a note of, of other, the values that we've selected. So here beta one is this difference in the two situations. So here it's the log odds of the 0.65, take away the log odds of the 0.51. And if we run that, that'll give us that 0.619. Okay, same design again, 30 questions, 25 pupils, 10 scores. Okay, then we're gonna create the objects in the environment again, the values that we've selected. So just create these. Put this down a little bit, we can see them a bit better. This across, okay. Uh, same numbers of pupils and scores, like I said, to create these as objects and then create that data frame. So it's exactly the same as before, we've just got the columns and each row is an observation. So I'm going to add in the effect of predictor, the, add in the effect of the predictor. But first of all, we need to simulate those observations of the predictor, like we said. So we've said that we're going to simulate observations of tutoring according to this model. So we've got the tutoring status of pupil P is Bernoulli distributed with this parameter theta, where theta is the probability that that pupil actually received tutoring. And that log odds of that is just the intercept. All that's in there is this. 0.3 probability basically. So this is saying every pupil has a 0.3 probability um, of having had tutoring. So exactly what we said a minute ago. So to do that, uh, I'm just gonna skip to using the R binom function and we're just gonna put this probability value in raw. Um, so rather than go through the steps that we've done before uh, where we sort of specify it as log odds and then convert and then sample, just because we're not gonna add to this, I'm just gonna put the probability straight in there and sample from it. So we've created this, uh, this vector of observations called tutoring status. So if I print that out, I'm going to have 250 zeros and ones. So there we go. So the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pupils were not tutored, the next two were, etc. That's what that's saying. And then I'm going to add that to the data frame. Again, I'm using this repeat here, but if you prefer to use uh, like a dplyr function, then, then do that. Um, okay, so then we, here we got the, the tutoring status. And again, we're repeating that for each pupil. So pupil one wasn't tutored. So that's going to stay zero all the way down. If you remember, I think it was only until we got to the eighth person they were tutored. So we won't see a one in this column until then. Yeah, so there we go. It only starts tutoring here. Okay. Um, and we can also check that, that we're about where we want it to be in terms of uh, the mean of that, as in like the proportion of, of ones in that column, which should be 0.3. There we go, we're a little bit over. So that's just a function of the fact that we are randomly sampling from this distribution. So on this, this occasion, this draw, um, it's 0.32. Obviously, I've not set the seed in, in the script anywhere. So when you're doing it, you'll get a slightly different number too. Okay, so now we're going to uh, add the components of our linear model to our data frame. So we've got the intercept, we've got this effect, we've already got this tutoring observation in the data frame, we're not going to add that in again, because we've already got it. Uh, and then we've got these random variances. So let's pop the fixed effects in. And like we said, fixed effects are just a number, They're the same number all the way down. They don't vary according to what the indexes are, the pupil, the school, and the question. 
Uh, I'm then going to create those deviates again for the pupil, the school, and the question, and then add them to the data frame. I won't uh, labor the point because we've done that before. There we go. Got those in as well. Bro. So those are all the components we wanted for our linear model. I'm then going to create the log odds of each row. So our log odds is just following that exact same format. So we've got the intercept, and then we've got this effects times by the, the observation of whether they were tutored or not, then plus all our random variances. Then we're going to convert that to a probability with this logistic function. And then we're going to use that probability uh, to randomly sample from a, a Bernoulli distribution or this binomial distribution with a trial size of one. Okay. So if we take a look, uh, it's getting a bit long at this point, uh, but the log odds here, you can calculate it manually to double check that your, your code's right. So you could take this intercept zero and add nothing to uh, whatever the tutoring value is times beta one. So this person doesn't get this sort of extra boost from tutoring because they weren't tutored. So the log odds here is literally just gonna be these three numbers summed together. But then when we get down to like pupil eight, which is a bit of a way down, there we go. So they were tutored. So in theirs, we're gonna end up with a slightly higher number because we're getting one times this number here plus the deviates to give the log odds commit to probability. Uh, with the response, which actually they got wrong on the first question, but the rest they got right, so go them. Okay, uh, so if we look at the histogram of this, uh, things are going to yeah, make the plot bigger first. Things are going to change a little bit uh, in that we start to see a slight change in the, the number of things that are getting right and wrong because we're starting to change, like basically we ended up with distributions within a distribution. We've got this subset of samples now where some people were tutored and some people weren't. And there's differences in the probability of them getting a question right if they were and weren't tutored. Uh, but the probability of seeing someone tutored was about 30%. So we're not going to see huge differences. Uh, and when we take the mean, we get a slightly higher one. So that's just why it starts to get a little bit more noisy and we start to see slightly different numbers here. And I've also added a plot hint so we can uh, check out the effect of tutoring with this really excited exclamation mark here. So let's do that. So this is calculated on the observed probabilities. So I'll just zoom in on that. So this is the group that were not tutored, and this is the group that were tutored. Uh, the differences in height are just because there's so many more people not being tutored than are being tutored. But what's of interest is the difference between the bars. So there should be a bigger difference between the proportion of questions you're getting right having received tutoring versus questions that you're getting wrong. Questions you're getting right having not received tutoring even. If that makes sense. Okay, so we've basically done it at that point. We've added a predictor to our model. Uh, we could even fit a model if we wanted to sort of estimate that fact. So if we were doing like a, a GLME R model, uh, we could have I get what it's called response as the outcome predicted by I think it was called tutoring in the data frame, uh, and we've got those random intercepts in there. So we've got uh, pupil plus question school that's everything the family again classes binomial with a logit link and the sim data frame is where it's held just call it model let's take a second to run hopefully not too long. There we go. Okay. So if we take a look at that and see how, how accurate we are. Yeah, so not great, actually. Um, but we do get a significant effect, at least, uh, which we're going to look at in a little while after the next section. Uh, so the intercept estimated to be 0.33. It's, we, we know we actually simulated it to be point at zero, to zero, and the effective tutoring, we're getting this uh, 0.45, and we wanted that to be 0.61. So at least we're in the right direction, anyway. Uh, and these variances are standard deviations. If you remember, we had the sigma one for pupil. The question we had sigma ones so are a bit under there, but we are sampling a sample of, of 30 from a distribution. So if you think how representative 30 observations from a normal distribution is, it's not surprising. Um, although this one's pretty pretty on point. So uh, we wanted this to be 0.5. If you remember the sigma for school was 0.5 and we've got 0.54 here. So not too bad. Okay, so well, let's- to Copy the GLMER code into the chat. Would that be possible, please? Sir? Yeah. It is actually lower down because in a little bit, we're going to fit that model and simulate from it. So, but I'll put it in anyway, just because it's exciting, isn't it? Uh, plus it's interesting to see in your, your set where you 
what you got up to in terms of your effects and what's in there. Okay, so I'll go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so Brill, so we've got one predictor in there, uh, but we had another predictor, this number of days absent from school. And that's what we're gonna look at putting in now. So predictor two, absence, um, and how we're measuring it, we're just gonna take a, like a raw count of how many days in that school year that person missed. So we know this is probably gonna be like a probabilistic thing. We're, we're not sort of assigning people to how many days they had off. We're taking an observational measure. But if we're having it probabilistic, we need to think of a, like a probability distribution, but what probability distribution is reasonable and is one that we should use. So there's some sort of examples here. Obviously the distribution in the, the right hand corner is probably the least plausible, I would say. So that's kind of like a uniform distribution. And that's saying that any number of days off is as equal is as probable as, as another. So uh, having zero days off is as probable as like having 200 days off, uh, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but there's some, some others on, on the left that look a little bit more reasonable in terms of what we might expect uh, in terms of observing how many days someone would have off. That's what's most probable. So we could think of uh, absent or absenteeism uh, as being a binomial distribution. If we want to think of a really, really simplified model of absence, we might consider it to be a sum of Bernoulli trials. So what I mean by that is if we say, okay, well, for each day when a pupil wakes up on school, they can either be in school or out of school. So they can be present or absent. Um, so this has like these two binary outcomes. There's no other uh, observation that you can do either in or you're out. Um, and then if we sum up how many times that they're, they're absent over a school year, then we end up with a binomial distribution, which is just a count of how many times we ended up with, a, with an absent mark. So basically we could just simulate, simulate this physically with the, the binomial model, which is what we're gonna do. Um, this is one way that you could think about absenteeism. Um, and we're gonna come back to this in a couple of minutes in terms of like evaluation. But we can formalize this model by saying, okay, well the absence count of pupil P, so how many days they were absent is binomial distributed with these parameters N and uh, theta, when N is the, the number of school days. Uh, I think in for UK, it's about 195 school days in a year. And the theta is that probability that they were absent um, on any one school day. So if we said that the log odds of the probability of being absent uh, is just beta zero, um, and then we can set that intercept value to be the log odds of 0.02. I'm not selecting that for any particular reason other than it gives me a distribution that looks somewhat plausible, which I'll show you in a second. So what this model is basically saying is that for every single pupil in every school across the country, uh, when they wake up, they have a 2% chance of being off on that day, okay? And any, any school day, they wake up, 2% chance they're not gonna be in. And we're just gonna sort of run the whole imaginary school year and see how many days they had off and then count that up. And that's the distribution that we're gonna use. In terms of what that looks like, this is what I mean in terms of sort of reasonableness. So we end up with this quite common number of days off. Um, it's not super common to be in all the days, but some people are doing it. So they have these zero days absence um, and it's pretty uncommon to have more than, well, more than 10 days off actually. Um, even when we get past 15, the probabilities here are really, really low. Um, this is what it looks like, basically. If we assume this model of as generating these uh, observations of absence. But is this model a good approximation or even really a good idea? Um, well, there's some pretty theoretically questionable parts about this model of absenteeism. Um, we're treating all the pupils as the same, which we know isn't true. Uh, some people are, are kind of like prolific uh, truanters and they, they don't come in very much. Um, that, so that would make it a pretty big assumption by saying everyone's got 2% chance of being off any day, every day. Um, and we're also saying that absence on one day doesn't relate to absence on another day. Um, whereas we know that if people have an illness, they don't tend to be off for just one day, it tends to be a couple of days that they're off. So we've got this correlation there. Um, so we're not building that into the model. We're just always saying you've always got a 2% chance, no matter what, no matter who, why, when, or how. We've also got some practically questionable parts about the distribution. So we don't see really any absenteeism beyond 18 days, it's super unlikely. But practically we know that maybe actually there are pupils that behave that way, even though they are rare, but our model might underestimate how common they are. And then this last part, the average, uh, we've got average absenteeism is about 3.5 days. Um, when I was first writing this, to me, that sounded about reasonable, uh, but I had to look afterwards and checked. And apparently in the UK, it's something like 10 days. Um, so actually 
a, a bigger average, but yeah. So if you were doing due diligence um, and trying to create an observation that's a lot more similar to real data, then you need to really consider the things that these models are saying by what they're also not saying, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's how we're gonna create the observations um, of absenteeism. We just need to add the effects now. So we've got the observations, add the effects into the model. So in terms of our uh, logistic model, again, same structure. Uh, we've just uh, put um, the variates for question underneath, we just run out of space here at the side. And we've got this section here, this uh, beta two absence P, where beta two is the effect of a one unit increase in absence. And the absence is the, the count of the number of days that that pupil was absent. So basically what we just said a minute ago. Okay, so like before, how do we select a value for that effect? Again, it'd be great if we had previous research or um, a really good source of data, but ultimately when it comes to parameterizing your effects, if you knew what it was, you wouldn't be doing your study. So you've always got to take a, a bit of a, a guess here um, and select a range of values or what's plausible, whatever. Um, you can justify and what, what meets your, your needs, I suppose. Okay, so this count of the number of days absent, um, it, it's gonna be not just binary um, like we had before. So when we had tutoring, it was just zero or one. So selecting that one unit increase was really straightforward. It's just the difference in probability um, for if you weren't tutored, for if you were tutored. But because absence is non-binary, how do we select that value for the effect? So is there an easy way to do that? Well, one way we can think of is to do these three steps. So we can think about what's the range of the variable. So from the minimum to the maximum value that we expect to see. And on our distribution, it's about like 18 days to zero days. So that's kind of the, the, the working range we could say. Um, and then from the minimum to the maximum value, what's a reasonable change or the smallest effect of interest uh, in the outcome? So for someone who has zero days absenteeism to someone who is off like the maximum range that you observe or the, the practically maximum range. So in our case, about 18 days, how, how badly is that gonna affect the log odds of them getting a question right? And then we divide that number by the number of unit increases uh, from the distance between the minimum and the maximum value. And this sounds a bit convoluted. Um, so I'll give you an example. So for absence, like I said, we've got this, this working range, shall we say of one to 18. Um, so zero days absent versus 18 days absence, which is quite a rare uh, number of absence. Uh, realistically, it could go all the way to 195, but we don't really expect to see anything beyond 18, given our model that we're creating these observations from. So in terms of the minimum to the maximum value, what's a reasonable change? Well, we know if someone has zero days absent, we're just at the intercept basically. And the probability of them getting a question right is 0.5. So we might say that being off for 18 days could reduce your, pro your probability or the log odds of the probability, um, or that we've given it as probability here, the probability of getting a question right um, all the way down to like 2%. So maybe like absence is really bad. Um, for your, your probability of getting a question right on that exam, which we know to be true, it, it does have a negative effect. Uh, in terms of the size of the effect, it's up to you to consider whether that's a reasonable one or not. We then divide this number by the number of units that we go from zero to 18. So it's, it's 18 basically. So in terms of, oh, sorry, in the log, we need to calculate the log odds difference first, sorry. Um, so take the log odds of the, the, the outcome at its maximum value, take away the log odds the outcome and its minimum value, it gives you this change in the log odds over the full range of the variable from minimum to maximum, and then divide that by the number of units, which gives us minus 0.2-ish. And that's the single unit increase uh, for beta two. Sorry for the convoluted explanation there. So basically what we're doing is saying, what's the minimum to the maximum? How big of a change do we expect to see in the outcome of that range? Convert that to log odds, divided by how many units we take to get there from the minimum to maximum, and that's the coefficient. Now for the um, logistic model, that logic link function to a probability number, that's a, called a nonlinear transformation. So linear increases in one don't correspond to linear increases in the other. It's just a point that I want to make in terms of interpretation. So for every one unit increase in beta two, so the effect of absence, we do get a linear increase in the, the log odds, but what we don't get is a linear increase in probability because of that transformation not being linear. So what that means is unit increases don't give us the same 
probability increases over time. They give us the same the same log odds increases over time, but not the same probability increases over time. And I'll give an example to show you what I mean. So assuming we just had this, this model where we ignore everything else for a minute, if we say that the, they have zero days absence, we've got this intercept of zero, we've got this effect of this minus 0.2, we times by absence, they don't have any, their log odds is zero, the probability is 0.5. That's where, where we are right now in terms of no absence. Then when someone has one day's absence, we have one lot of this coefficient. So one times not 0.2 minus 0.2. Log odds is minus 0.2. And the probability is that is 0.45. So we have this 5% drop uh, for this one day absence. But then when you start to get down to values down here, um, the change in the probability isn't linear anymore. So to give an example, when we have uh, 18 days absence, we times the 18 by the 0.2 minus 0.2 to give us this log odds of minus 3.6. And the probability of that value is 0.02. And the difference between 17 days in probability terms and 18 days in probability terms is only 1%. So because of the, log the logic function being nonlinear, even though at each point here, we have a difference of 0.2 going down, the difference in probability doesn't stay the same. So just to be aware of that, that when it comes to interpreting these, um, it, it depends whereabouts you are relative to the intercept and how many this is, because linear changes in this aren't linear changes in that. That makes sense. Okay. Having said that, uh, we can put this in R now because we've got everything we need to do so. Are there any questions at that point? Nothing in the chat, but if anyone has something on any clarification or anything, please let us know. <clears throat> cool. Okay. So clear it in a way again. Okay, so section four. So exact same model as before, exact same situation. It's just we've now got this part in the model, which is the effect of absence with some observation of absence as well, uh, which here is the difference in the log odds between these, which gives us this minus 0 0.2. Okay. So we run these, create them as objects in the environment. There we go. And the rest, and I'll just create that data frame now as well. So it's the exact same data frame as before. Nothing's changed. I'm sure you're tired of hearing that by now. Um, okay, the observation of tutoring that we created before, um, we're creating that in just the same way. So every pupil has that 30% um, chance of being someone who received tutoring. In absence, we're creating, um, as we said, as a, a binomial distribution. So an observation from that binomial distribution um, where on every day, a pupil has a 2% chance of being off. So again, it might not be a very reasonable model, but that's what, what we're gonna use. So we create a, a vector of the, the count of absences, uh, which is here. So we've got this first value of five, the next one's five. So the first two people were off five days in the school year. Then we're gonna add that to the data frame and we can take a look at that. Uh, so we've got this absence count for five for the first pupil, and as it goes down, it'll change. Pupil seven up four days off, et cetera. Uh, we're not building any dependence in, in terms of like the relationship between tutoring and absence. So these are kind of just assumed to be independent. Uh, but maybe we might actually expect that absence and tutoring could relate to each other. So maybe people who are, who are off a considerable amount might make up for time um, with having private tutoring, or maybe we might actually see that people who are really studious aren't off very often and also have, have tutoring. Uh, but we're not taking any of that into account in our model. We're just saying they're separate. They don't co-vary. They don't care about that relationship, even if it's there. Okay, so we'll add in these columns for the effects, which are the fixed effects because they're the same for everyone. So it's 0.619 for the effect of tutoring and minus 0.2 for the effect of absence. Then I'm going to add in those deviates that we did before for pupil, school, and question. Add those in as columns. And then just like before, we're gonna create this log odds um, of the response being correct. And we've got the intercept, the effect of tutoring times the observation of tutoring, the effect of absence times the observation of absence, and then the variance at the level of pupil, pupil school in question. Okay, and then convert that to a probability and then sample from the binomial distribution with a trial size of one, so binary. And here we go, so it's getting longer and longer at this point um, and we end up with for this person, their absence five is times by this beta two. So they get five lots of this, so like minus one or whatever the score is. 
and they weren't tutored, so they don't get this increase of log odds here. They just get an intercept, five lots of beta two, and then the, these rows are added up uh, to create their log odds. And then finally, the probability, and then their observation of a correct response or not. Okay. And now if we take a look at the simulated responses, let me make this bigger, things are going to be a little bit more noticeably different now uh, because we have people in our model um, that actually the average number of days of being off is uh, 3.5. So that means that the average probability of getting one right isn't going to be 5.5 uh, 5 anymore. We're going to, going to be lower than that. And it's going to be point, minus 0 0.2 times like three and a half lower than 0.5, whatever that is, as in uh, here was the average. But on average, we have 3.5 times oops, minus 0.2-ish less. So the mean should be around 1.2 in probability. Oh, yeah, I'm a, <laughs> in times in log odds here. So ignore this. Sorry. Uh, it was a drop of like 0.5, wasn't it? So the average probability should be around 0 0.4, 0 0.35, something like that. 0.4, okay, so more or less what it is. If you didn't follow what I'm saying there, what I basically mean is um, because we've got these people now in our data frame that are off, um, this is gonna change where the intercept is now. So the average number of, the average probability of getting a question right uh, is gonna differ because on average, people tend to be off about three days. And we can take a look at the GG plot of the effect of absence in terms of the observed probabilities. So here, each sort of box that's numbered uh, is the number of days someone was off for. So in the case of no days off, um, the difference between them is about zero is about half of one. It's hard to see because like the number of counts is, is how many times you see them. So the higher ones is more often people were off four days, three days, two days. Not many people were, were not off at all. But you start to see that things change. We end up with uh, the left-hand bar, zero responses are, are about like 50 50 with one and then as the number of days increases then we start to see people getting questions wrong a lot more than they're getting them right um, when we get down to other observations it gets a bit noisy because we, we get less people in these situations uh, with having ex extreme numbers of days off does that make sense uh, and we can calculate the the um, observed probabilities with this aggregate function so we can um, count the responses by whether they were absent and then calculate the mean so we're taking like the average probability um, or average observed probability of getting it right or wrong. So here for someone who was off no days, the observed probability of them getting a question right was 0.58. So above chance actually. Uh, if you were off one day, your observed probability was 0.55. As you can see, it starts to drop. Uh, they are a bit noisy because we don't have that many observations of people who are off nine or eight days. Um, and we've got this 0.2 here, which is the lowest. Uh, but in reality, we know that actually people who are lower down will have the lowest probability. But that's just because we don't have many observations there and it is noisy data. And that's just how it goes. Okay, so we've done it in terms of adding two predictors to the model. Um, so we'll move on to the next section now, which is about power. Okay, so if you remember our hypothetical study, we had these um, schools and pupils uh, and questions and uh, we're taking a measure of tutoring, we're taking a measure of absence. These are our effects. Um, and we've got these one to 30 questions on our reading ability task. So in terms of our design adequacy, we might think about whether our study is able to answer our, re our research question, if there's an effect of these things. Um, in terms of statistical power, there's other ways like um, precision, if we wanted to, like confidence interval wits that was mentioned the other day. Um, but we're just gonna look at statistical power here. So given the fact that we've sort of simulated up until this point with 25 people, uh, pupils even, from 10 schools, 30 questions on the test, uh, what's the probability that we can get p-values for the effects of tutoring and absence, which are less than 0.05? So we know that those effects exist in our data frame. We've created them. So given that they exist and that those values we've selected, what's the probability that we're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis? We're going to be able to say that they're not zero, OK? So previously, um, we've talked about what we need to do uh, in other sessions. We simulate the data, we fit the model, which is basically just a copy of the model that, model that we've simulated from. We just fit it instead. Uh, we extract the elements of interest, which in our case is going to be the, the p-values for those effects. And then we repeat that a whole bunch of times 
um, and calculate the proportion of times that we achieve that criteria. Um, typically, like it's a thousand times that we do it. We're not going to do a thousand times here because the models do take a couple of seconds to run. So even like 10 fits is going to take like maybe like a minute or two. So if we did a thousand, we would definitely run out of time. In terms of putting it into R, uh, we just need to add a bit of code that uh, fits the model. Then we're going to add a bit of code that saves the estimates from that model. And then we're going to wrap the whole thing in a for loop like you've seen before. So let's do that. So any questions at that point? I don't think so. I guess that's a good thing or a really bad thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> OK, power five. So I just clear all this away again. Again, you don't have to clear all this if you don't want to. It's just, just to show that it's all sort of self-contained, these sections as they run. So we're going to um, evaluate the power for this model that we just simulated from in the last section, where we've got these two predictors, uh, and they've each got these effects. And so it's like that 0.619 for the effect of tutoring, and that minus 0.2-ish for the effect of absence per unit increase. And we're going to look at how probable it is that we're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis, given that they're there. With this design, we've got 25 people, 10 schools, uh, and 30 questions. So again, I'm just declaring all the things that we've already seen before. And then we come to this, the setup for the, for the loop, basically. So outside of the loop, we just specify how many times we want to do it. So this is just an object in the environment that says a number. So here, I'm just going to set it to 10. If you want to, if you've got a really fast computer, set it to as, as many as you want. Um, but yeah, the, the, I guess the industry average or whatever is like a 1,000. Uh, we're then going to create this empty data frame to collect our results in. Um, if, if you want to, you can create a, a matrix of the number that you expect to to get like we've seen before where you set it for like if you know you're going to do 10 simulations you create like 10 empty rows and save the data um, i'm just going to be a bit lazy here and just say just create me a, a an empty data frame with nothing in it and i'll just keep adding to it then we've got the start of the for loop which says for each simulation and this number from one to n simulations which is just this list of, of one to ten because we've set n simulations to be ten then do this everything contained in the loop and if we scroll all the way down, this is just the code that was in part four. So we've just slotted it into the for loop, basically. But we've added this section to fit a model. This is the model that I shared in the chat more or less before. So we've got this effect of absence now. So we create this sim model as this DLMER model from the LME4 package. And we fit the random intercepts here, the two fixed effects, um, with the binomial model with the logic link. We then uh, extract the model summary and create that as an object. And then we create this temp results uh, data frame where we just have like a column which tells us what simulation one we were on. I've also uh, extracted the effect value. So what was the point estimate of that effect? And I just uh, make a call using the dollar sign to within the object model summary to the coefficients table, uh, like you've seen before, if you went to some of the previous sessions. Um, and then we're just calling that, that row within the, the column and the row for the, for the effect of tutoring. And then the column and the row for the p-value for tutoring, and then the same for absence as well. And then when we're binding that together in our results data frame with the temp results that we've just created here, and it's just recursive to keep adding rows to uh, our data frame, as we probably already know. Um, and I've just added a line to tell you how far through the simulation you are, so it can give you an idea of, of how long you can be, be waiting for. OK, so just go back up to the top. We can set this off. So. Give it a minute to run. Should be two to have ten, but if you've set it for something more, then yeah, you'll be waiting for a bit of time. Um, it is quicker to do things without random intercepts and random effects um, because there's a bit less in terms of what's being estimated. And um, so, if you are doing something that's a more complex model, then this time is just a reflection of how long the models have, have taken to fit. Funny, we've got a question in the chat, which is, uh, what's the justification for the number of reps? Like that's from Jacqueline. Uh, as in the number of simulations? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Did you say, yeah? Yeah, yeah, the number of simulations. So here I've just set it to 10 just, just to show you as it runs through because I've not got time to do it for more. Usually it's a thousand because people tend to say that that's about as many as we would want to get a decent estimate of the statistical power because we're estimating power here, we're not calculating it. If we'd used a formula to calculate power, then we get the exact solution. But because we're using simulation, we need to do it lots and lots of times to estimate it. A bit like when you estimate the mean, 
Um, you have to take lots of samples. These simulations are the samples. A thousand is meant to give like a, a decent view of like the randomness in the simulation. Um, and then you take the, the average of that many samples. You can get designs where actually a thousand is not enough and you should do more simulations, um, but people don't tend to do more than a thousand. Sometimes I've seen like 10,000, but I think that's a lot less common. A thousand is usually just what you go for in the same way that people pick an alpha of 0.05. I'm not saying it's right. It's just what people do. Okay, so. Uh, I was wondering how uh, can you calculate the number of repetitions when convergence of the model does not occur? Yeah, 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 I've done that before. Um, so you can get ones where you end up with the, the model not fitting continuously. You can use what's uh, I called it like a while function. I think it was where you say like, if this number hasn't been fulfilled yet, so say I want like 10 or 100 or 1000 simulations, um, and you keep count of how many failed and how many converged. Um, and you say, until I've reached that number, keep running them. And then when I get to the point where I've done it, um, stop, basically. Um, I don't know the, the code off offhand, so I can't give it to you, but I think I'm pretty sure it's called a while. While Thanks, this is happening, do this. That, that was a question from my mate. Thank you. Okay, bro. So scrolled really far down. <laughs> okay, so we've run our simulation. And if you've done it on your PC, hopefully yours is more or less finished by now. Um, and now we can do this bit where we can estimate power. And what I'm going to do to do that is to just add a binary indicator to this results data frame that we've created. And if we have a quick look at the results data frame. So for each simulation, I did 10 simulations. I've got a row for the model fit. I've got this effect of tutoring, this effect of absence, and the two p-values for those. I'm then going to add a column for each of those to say whether it was significant or not. So it says, if else, if the p-value for the tutoring was less than 0 0.05, give it a one. If it was above that or equal to it, it can give it a zero, so like a fail. And then if we take a look in the results data frame, uh, you can see that these p-values are they're happy. So good stuff. And we can take the mean of that as the proportion of significance. So basically the, the probability uh, of getting significance. And according to our design, we're doing really well. But again, this is just 10 samples. And if we were to actually estimate the power with a bit more accuracy, we should increase it. Um, but according to this, it, it looks promising. So if we ran a, a thousand simulations, we, we look like we, we could well be above the 80% the power, which is that conventional level. Okay, so next part. Okay, so in terms of going further, uh, we might consider some, some more elements for our model. So for example, we often have in our designs these uh, within participant predictors. So not just uh, nested observations of the outcome, but also nested observations of the predictors. So sometimes if you're in the same condition, so like a repeated measures design. So if we had this repeated measures design, we could consider random slopes. So that's random variability in the effects basically. So that's basically kind of like saying if tutoring was within like a repeated measure, so people uh, participated in a condition where they were tutored and where they weren't tutored before a test, assuming there's like two tests, um, then we could say the effect of tutoring differs between people if there was random slope variability on that effect. So like I said, we'd need to have observations of people being in both conditions to be able to add these random slopes. Um, so it's kind of like longitudinal data or just a design where you, you're under both conditions, repeated measures designs. If you recall, the design that we've been working with so far isn't repeated measures, so we're going to have to alter that a little bit to be able to include random slopes to look at here. So we're going to alter this to be looking just at the effect of tutoring. We're going to just ignore the days absent for now and look at reading ability. And we're going to assume that there's two tests now. So we're going to sample people in the same way from a sample of schools. And we're going to say that there's going to be this first reading test where people receive tutoring and answer 30 questions. And then there's going to be a, a second reading test where they don't receive tutoring and answer 30 different questions for that test, if that makes sense. So now tutoring is, is repeated measures, it's within participants. So the tutoring predictor, now that we are kind of assigning people to be tutored or not, then we're just going to have it as a balanced 50-50, you're either tutored or you're not, and you're going to be in both conditions. So like a perfect design where everyone takes part in both conditions. If you wanted to make it noisier, then you can just sort of drop out some rows from your data frame at random to, to simulate missing random data. Um, but we're also going to add a new index to our model, um, T, which will be like the test that they're doing. Uh, and that's going to be whether they're doing test one or test two. 
So if we look at the, the new model, we can say the response of a pupil from a school to a question on a test, so whether we're doing test one or test two, is Bernoulli distributed with some probability for the parameter theta, which is the probability that that response was correct for that pupil from that school to the question on that test. And then in terms of our linear model here, we've got rid of the absence effects. Like I said, we're not going to consider that. We've just got the effect of tutoring specific to the pupil and the test. And we've got the fixed effect here that we had before, this value. We've also got this part here, which we're having as pupil variability in that effect in tutoring. So this here is the random slope. And again, the fixed part, we're going to keep the same as the 0.62 or 0.619 that we had before. And we're going to have this random part which controls variability and that's how some people get a stronger effect of tutoring and some people don't really benefit very much from tutoring or might even get worse from tutoring. I would hope not, but you never know. So we're gonna parameterize the, the sigma, the standard deviation of this distribution. So again, how to select what this should be. Um, you can think about the size, the scale of the sigma, and you can think about that relative to the size of the effect. Uh, we've got this 0.62. Uh, and if these were the standard deviations, these would capture how much people sort of like diverge from this average. So how, how different would, would you see people? If the standard deviation of our, our random slopes was five, that's, that's quite a massive difference from this average, really, really noisy effect. Um, so like 95% of people would have plus or minus two lots of this on their score. Um, that's quite high. So we might consider something a little bit lower. Um, so I'm gonna consider 0.5. So a decent amount of variability, but not clear, clearly not masses of variability. Okay, so we're just gonna put this in R. Let's take a look. Okay. So we've got this model that we said, now we've got this extra, um, test index. So the response of a pupil from a school to a question to a test is Bernoulli with this parameter theta, which is the probability that it was correct. And then this linear model, we've got the intercept, a fixed effect here, plus their individual deviate at the random slope times by whether they were tutored or not for that observation, plus the randomness. Now we're just to declare all these variables and let's create these in the environment and create that data frame. And if you noticed here, I've got this new column called test. Uh, and that's just to reflect that index of whether they're doing test one or test two. So the first 30 questions are gonna be on test one. And the next uh, 30 questions are gonna be on test two. Okay. So observations of predictors, like we said, uh, we're just gonna have observations of tutoring as 50-50 because we're just assigning people now to whether they receive tutoring or not. So we're just gonna repeat zero and one for half of the participants' responses all the way through. So this first test, they received no tutoring. And then for the second test, they did. They're just repeating all the way through. Okay. Add in the fixed elements, exactly the same as before with the intercept and the effect of tutoring. And then we've got the random intercept variances that we're gonna add in that we had. Add those in. And now we've got the slope variance part. And it's basically the exact same logic as the random intercepts part. It's just we add it to the, to the effect value before we times it by the observation of tutoring. So first we create this uh, vector of random slope deviates, random effect deviates here. Uh, and then we're gonna add those to the data frame just the same way as the, the random intercepts. So here we get this deviate for the slope. <laughs> okay. Calculate the log odds of the response, just like we did before. But like I said, we're adding the fixed effects and the deviate together and then times in by the observation of tutoring. Convert that to a probability and then sample from that binomial distribution. So again, we just end up with this log odds probability response. Okay. And we can look at the uh, histogram, which as always is not particularly exciting uh, in the mean. But what's more interesting is to check out those random slopes. And these are on the effective tutoring on the observed probabilities. So let's take a look at that. So instead of having straight lines now, so if everyone had the same effect, there's a lot more noise in there now. So some people have quite steep slopes. Some people have uh, almost flat slopes. And there's actually quite a few negative slopes in there. So that sigma that we set is enough that for some people, the effect of tutoring is negative. Um, so if we were doing this for real, we might think, is that a reasonable thing to think about? To think that 
that tutoring can reduce your, your performance on an exam. Um, right now, maybe, maybe not. I guess it depends on <laughs> what these tutors are doing with their pupils, I guess. Uh, we can also calculate the, the proportions of those uh, as well. So the probability of getting a question right, given that you've not had any tutoring, which here is that 0.48, so around 0.5, which was the intercept. And then we've got this uh, probability of getting it right, given that you've had tutoring, which is 0.63. And if you imagine, uh, remember the average effect, so that beta one, the fixed effect just on its own was the 0.65. And we're getting more or less there. Uh, we've just got deviance around that. And we're gonna end up with more noise because we're introducing more noise to the model. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left uh, to talk about covariance. Uh, if there's no questions, I'll just steam, steam ahead. Um, oh yeah, just before we do talk about covariance, just to consider uh, that this model that we just specified doesn't uh, consider the impact of test occasion. So the only difference between those two observations, like test one and test two, um, is due to the effect of tutoring. Um, but if you were doing like an actual longitudinal design, you might consider that there's like developmental stuff happening and people improve for all kinds of reasons, or maybe actually they might drop for different reasons. Um, it's also not counterbalanced that design that we just did. Everyone did test one on occasion one, and everyone did test two. Uh, on occasion two, having had tutoring. So if there was differences between tests, we wouldn't know if it was the effect of the test or if it was the effect of tutoring. Um, so we'd really want to counterbalance that if we were actually doing this as a study. Uh, and that, that model didn't also consider the relationship between random slopes and random intercepts, which is what we're going to look at in terms of covariance. So the covariance between the intercept and the slope, we could sort of think that people start at different places in that probability. And because of those different starting points, they might systematically respond differently to the effect of tutoring. So if you think, for example, someone who's already quite weak in terms of how likely they are to answer a question correctly, they might not respond very well to tutoring because they've got so much ground to make up that the tutoring just isn't having that much of a, an effect on them. But someone who's really, really able might get quite a lot out of tutoring. So they'll have a really, really strong effect of tutoring. So that's what that, that covariance ends up, you end up with a relationship between your starting point and your finish point. So we can capture that by allowing the individual deviates to co-vary. And what I mean by that is when we simulate those individual deviates at the pupil level, instead of simulating them from two separate uh, univariate normals, two normal distributions, we could actually use what's called a bivariate normal with a covariance. So this is kind of some of the, some of the stuff in the faux package where we're specifying a relationship between these normal variables. We can say that there's covariance, they're dependent, and your difference from the intercept is gonna be related to your difference from the effect. So let's take a look and do that in R really quickly. I know we've only got five minutes, but no pressure. So I'm gonna run through this code fairly quickly uh, in terms of what we're saying. So we've got this model, it's basically the same as the one that we just looked at with that random slope. But in terms of the sigmas of these, we end up sampling from a bivariate normal that has this uh, vector of means, which are both zero, sorry, here, and this sigma, which is the covariance matrix. So this, this is getting down to more complex stuff. So if, you, if it's a little bit unfamiliar, then honestly, don't worry, it's fine. Um, and if I had more time, I'd go through this uh, properly and it, it would make a lot more sense. But basically, we're just sampling from two, two distributions that are like stuck together and have a, a dependency structure. Okay, so if we do that, and I'm just gonna highlight this bit of the code mm -mm -mm, to create our distribution. Okay. So we've used the mass package, the MVR norm function to create these uh, deviates for like the intercept variance and the slope variance. Um, that's what we're going to add into our model and the data frame again, just like before. So if we have a quick scroll up to where that happened. So this MVR norm function here is the multivariate random normal um, and we're using it as, as having, having two, two normals, so a bivariate normal with two means and two sigmas uh, and this correlation, which I'm going to set to be somewhere. 0.8. Yeah, I'm going to say the correlation between random intercepts and random slopes is 0.8. So really, really dependent. So people who start higher on the intercept are going to improve more with the effective tutoring. 
uh, and people who start lower on the interceptor are going to improve less with deuterium. Okay, so we've done that. The histogram's boring, so we won't check that out. But if we check out the uh, the correlation, first of all, between the intercepts and the slope variances, we're doing pretty well at correlating those variances. And if we look at a plot of the deviates, so this is like the u sub zero i and u sub zero at zero, u sub one p. Yeah, u sub zero p, u sub one p. So uh, part, pupil deviate on the intercept, pupil deviate on the slope. We've got this relationship. And if we look in terms of the log odds that we've simulated, which is, I think, a really nice plot in terms of like conceptually trying to understand what's going on here. If you wait for it to load. So these are the log odds where people are starting. Each point is a pupil. So this is someone who is a really like, able pupil doing really well. And the slope is the strength of the effect of tutoring. So when they were tutored, they did really, really well. You can see people who were lower down, they actually, uh, they lost ground through tutoring. They really didn't do as well. And this positive covariance between uh, the intercept variance and the slope variance ends up in this sort of fanning out effect. You get this sort of this shape. Um, if it was a negative, then it does the opposite. It pinches in at the other end. So it's basically what we've simulated. So we've just simulated the, the structure where the effect depends on where you started uh, in that baseline group. So we're basically at time at this point. Uh, sorry that we rushed through that last section, uh, but I did want to mention it. I'm just sorry it was kind of rapid. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in those like 30 seconds. <laughs> Thanks. So yes, yeah, so there's just one question, which was if you want to uh, set the effect of tutoring on uh, to always be positive, would you use a different distribution in the simulation? Yeah, I, I guess. So um, if you had this fixed effect, this, this value for beta one, the effect of tutoring, that's just fixed. And if you want variance around it, um, then you can have that to be distributed however you want realistically. But it is worth saying that the multi-level model assumes that variability to be normally distributed. So if you're working within just the standard multi-level model framework, then you need to make sure that you're using a normal distribution for that. If you were using, um, if you're familiar with like the BRMS package, the Bayesian one, then you can put like a prior on that says it is a, a different distribution. Um, but here it's probably best to stick with the normal. You just want to make sure that the standard deviation doesn't take your effect negative. So look at what three standard deviations from that normal looks like. And if it's bigger than what your fixed effect is, then reduce it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was absolutely amazing. Um, we'll get this all put up onto uh, YouTube in the next couple of hours. It usually takes a long time to convert and stuff. But I'm sure everyone will agree that that was an absolutely fantastic workshop. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening and sticking with it. No, no, yeah. Okay.